feels that everything is okay and that we're ready to start. Uh -huh. Okay, great. We're just assigning host and co-host rights to share the screen. Uh, okay. Yeah, let me know when I should uh, when I should uh, start uh, sharing the screen. Perhaps you can try already. Uh, okay. Let's see if this works. Could the other camera in room two thirty be on so we okay. see the audience? Do you uh, do you see that? I don't see it yet, but not you. Uh, I yeah. think maybe we see it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. We see your slides just fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Ah, there and we now go. we see room two thirty. So is everything all set? So the live audience is ready. Great. So let's start. Um, the first talk today is by David Garfinkel from Oakland University, who's going to tell us about cosmic strings and distributions. Please, you may start. Uh, OK, hang on one second. There we go. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk today about cosmic strings and distributions. And um, I want to mention that uh, not too long ago, I gave a couple of talks at the Perimeter Institute, and they have um, an interesting um, sort of flipped method of giving talks in which you're supposed to give your entire talk in 10 minutes, and then the rest of the time is supposed to be taken up by questions. So I'm not going to do anything nearly um, as extreme today, but nonetheless, I've planned a comparatively short talk so that there'll be uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, all right, so let me start by um, uh, giving you an outline of the things that I'm going to cover. So first of all, I have to tell you what cosmic strings are, and those are um, basically objects usually referred to as topical defects. They are concentrations of energy formed um, possibly um, uh, in the early universe during the hot big bang. And so I want to start by telling you a little bit about phase transitions in the early universe and the formation of topological defects. And roughly speaking, um, I'm going to mention three classes of topological defects, domain walls, cosmic strings, and monopoles. And you'll, you'll see where those three classes come from. Now, cosmic strings can be very long, but also very thin. And um, that leads us to the temptation to model them as distributions. So basically, um, remember the idea is that one of the uses of a distribution is that you can treat you know, very thin objects as infinitely thin, and um, but still you know, sort of containing an appreciable amount of matter. And so it's tempting to treat cosmic strings as distributions. And I'll explain you know, sort of how that was done and, and what results go along with that. However, um, there are problems with treating, you know, sort of objects of zero size in general relativity. And in particular, the thing that's most relevant um, for trying to treat cosmic strings as distributions is a sort of no-go theorem due to Bob Garrosh and Jenny Trashen, in which they basically say that you're really not allowed to treat cosmic strings um, as distributions in general relativity. And then I'll talk about uh, possible ways to get around this no-go theorem. And then finally, I will uh, give conclusions. And, and again, um, at that point, there should still be plenty of time for questions. Um, OK, so. Uh, Let's think about the consequences of starting off the universe in a hot big bang. So in a hot big bang, um, everything you know has a whole bunch of energy, but as the universe uh, expands, things cool off. And so what that means 
um, is that uh, as the universe expands, um, fields that were um, originally in any old configuration at all um, tend to go to their configuration of lowest energy. So if that's a single um, configuration of lowest energy, um, then you know the field will try to get there. But it may very well be that um, there are more than one um, states of lowest energy. And so what you want to think of is, say, um, a scalar field with a potential um, that has more than one local minimum. So the easiest um, way to explain why this gives rise to these topological defects is to think about the simplest case, um, which is the case of domain walls. So imagine that you have um, a scalar field with a potential with two minima, um, and now um, the universe is cooling, and in one region of space, um, things fall into minimum one, and in another region of space, things fall into minimum two. And so now you have these, you know, sort of blobs of scalar field, um, and they're going to grow, and eventually they're going to meet. And trapped in between those two blobs will be um, a transition region where things go from minimum one to minimum two, and therefore um, for a space, uh, they, um, you know, for sort of a, a sort of thin region around the, the um, transition region, um, the scalar field is forced to be in something that's not the minimum, so it's going to have potential energy but also because it's going from you know, one uh, minimum to the other, it's going to have gradient energy. So basically what you're gonna have is a thin region in which um, uh, there's lots of energy and then on either side of it, not very much energy. So that's what happens um, when the space of vacua, that is the space of lowest energy configuration is disconnected. All right, so now suppose instead that the you know, configurations of lowest energy, that, that set of vacuum states is connected, but not simply connected. So then um, again, you can have this case where you have a phase transition and now the place where energy, uh, where the scalar field is forced to be out of the minimum um, and um, therefore has both big potential energy and big gradient energy. Now that won't be along a surface. Instead, it'll be along a curve. So uh, those are cosmic strings. And then there's similarly um, a case where um, the set of vacua is um, connected and simply connected, but in which you can't shrink all spheres to zero in, in the vacuum region. And um, that gives rise to um, sort of little, uh, um, you know, spherical blobs of stuff um, where the energy is concentrated. And those um, are usually referred to as monopoles. Okay, so basically the idea is all of this just depends on what the topology of the uh, space of vacua are. And if the topology is, um, is disconnected, you get domain walls. If it's connected, but not simply connected, um, you get cosmic strings. And if it's simply connected, but you can't shrink all spheres um, to a point, you get monopoles. Okay, so those are the possibilities. Now what we want to know is um, which of them are viable as, as a cosmological scenario. And um, let me explain to you why um, you should, you know, uh, start off by thinking that none of them are viable as a cosmological scenario, but that somewhat surprisingly um, uh, cosmic strings are. So one of the one of the sort of funny things um, about um, uh, the, well, one, one, one of the sort of um, uh, interesting features of cosmology um, is that, you know, in, in the logarithmic time that one normally uses to, to describe the early universe, there's actually a fairly long period in which things are radiation dominated. That is, the, the main um, uh, source of stress energy is, is just plain old um, uh, radiation. And um, 
one of the things that we first learn about cosmology is that as the universe expands, um, ordinary matter um, has a density that, that falls off like one over the scale factor cubed because each matter particle has you know, a fixed amount of energy, um, but um, it gets diluted by one over a cubed as the universe expands. But radiation falls off faster because not only does the volume expand, but also each individual radiation particle um, gets redshifted and therefore has its energy lowered by the expansion of the universe. So that means that when you form anything in the early universe, um, that uh, you're always in danger of um, basically um, having that stuff uh, become the dominant form of energy. Because if you form blobs of stuff and um, they have um, uh, an energy density that falls off like one over a cubed while the radiation is falling off like one over a to the fourth, in short order, that stuff will come to dominate the energy density of the universe. And that is inconsistent with um, the universe having a, a long period of radiation domination. And so in fact, um, uh, you might think that that sort of none of these objects could be part of a, a viable cosmological scenario. And in fact, one of the, the early motivations for the cosmological theory of inflation is that um, many of the theories that people had at the time predicted the existence of monopoles, and that was inconsistent with, um, uh, with, with what we see. Um, and so inflation was invoked with the notion that, okay, well, if you form monopoles, maybe you form them before inflation and then inflation will just, you know, um, uh, sort of dilute them through its, its exponential expansion. So in principle, you can form any of these things, but if they threaten to destroy radiation domination, you need to form them before inflation and then inflate, inflate them away. Um, Okay, so you might think that all of these topological defects, monopoles, domain walls, and, and cosmic strings are all subject to this exact same problem, but it turns out that, that they're not. And the reason is um, that unlike monopoles, which are isolated objects, cosmic strings and domain walls form a network, and that network can basically um, self-intersect um, and chop off pieces and therefore dilute itself as it goes along. Um, and so the funny thing about cosmic strings um, is that monopoles are ruled out because um, they fall off too slowly. Domain walls, even though they can chop uh, themselves up in this way, still have too much energy. Um, whereas cosmic strings have this funny property that even though they start out with more energy um, then monopoles, they chop themselves up fast enough that they don't actually um, destroy radiation dominance. And in fact, what happens is that during the radiation dominated phase, um, the, the um, density in cosmic strings falls off as fast as the radiation. So they neither dominate nor become negligible. Um, okay, so that, um, that made cosmic strings at least consistent um, with a, um, a cosmological scenario. Um, and in particular, um, this made cosmic strings, you know, back, um, say, in, in, the, uh, in the 80s when they were um, uh, extensively studied, possible candidates for the source of primordial density fluctuations. So they were of great interest, you know, back in the 80s when people thought, okay, you know, maybe this will account for the density fluctuations. Um, but since then, observations of fluctuations um, through the microwave background and the spectrum of galaxies have gotten much better. Um, and um, there have also been detailed calculations of uh, the um, fluctuations that you get from inflation. And those fluctuations match the observations, whereas the fluctuations you get from cosmic strings don't. So what that means is that cosmic strings um, were at one point a viable candidate um, 
for a, a theory of primordial density fluctuations, but they aren't any longer. So we are now well past the heyday of cosmic strings as a source of, of cosmological research. There was lots and lots of work on it back then, but, but people are much less interested today because they're not a viable density fluctuation scenario um, and inflation is. Um, now, in this talk, I'm going to focus very narrowly on the issue of distributions, but there's lots and lots of work um, that have been that has been done about cosmic strings over the years. And so if you're interested, um, you might want to look at the textbook by Vilenkin and Shellard and and the references therein. This is, you know, sort of just a way of saying that um, I'm only going to um, tell you a tiny bit um, about cosmic strings in this talk and and concentrate on something that, you know, an aspect of cosmic strings that I think is of interest to this program, but you should not get the impression that that's sort of the main thing about cosmic strings. There's lots and lots of stuff that's been done, and, and if you're interested in that stuff, you, you might want to look at this, uh, this textbook and, and references therein. Um, okay, so now let's get to the distribution part. Okay, so the first thing um, is that as long as um, the energy scale at which cosmic strings form is small compared to the Planck scale, um, then the um, mass per unit length of cosmic strings is much less than one. So here I'm using the units of relativity in which G and C are set equal to one. And in that case, a mass per unit length is actually a dimensionless number. And for cosmic strings, um, that mass per unit length describes how strongly gravitating things are. So for all, you know, and, and any cosmic strings that, that you know, had a, a, a mass per unit length anywhere, you know, close to one, um, you know, have already been ruled out by observation. So basically all, you know, possible viable, um, you know, scenarios that contain cosmic strings, those cosmic strings are weakly gravitating and therefore are well described by linearized gravity. That is by general relativity where you just truncate everything at linear order. And so you get a linear theory. Um, furthermore, um, as long as the energy scale of cosmic strings is much larger than that of the standard model, um, that means that cosmic string thicknesses are um, tiny compared to, say, a proton. Um, so here you have something which is well described by a linear theory um, and um, is, you know, can be thinner than a proton and bigger than a galaxy. And so that sounds like exactly the sort of thing where you would like to describe it as a distribution. That is to say, what you want to do um, is to approximate this, you know, thing that has very tiny thickness as something of zero thickness, um, and uh, which you can do in a linear theory. Um, and so when you do that, um, you, you know, get some nice um, straightforward results. So can um, I ask yeah, you a was, there, was there a question? Yeah, can I ask you one? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I should have mentioned that at the beginning. At any time, feel free to, to interrupt and ask questions. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I wonder, is there an easy way to see the relation between the parameter mu, the, the mass of the cosmic string per unit length, and sort of the microphysics from which the cosmic string would arise, the, the vacuum of the field, how the, the phase transition occurs. Is there a relation between? Uh, right, so, so for example, let's, let's sort of take um, a nice simple, um, uh, you know, um, uh, theory with, that gives rise to cosmic strings. So let's suppose we have a, um, uh, a complex scalar field um, uh, for reasons I don't want to get into also coupled to a gauge field. So now one nice simple, um, uh, you know, potential that will give rise to a cosmic string is to um, have a potential that's basically lambda times 
uh, phi squared minus eta squared quantity squared. So it's basically like a, a sort of lambda phi to the fourth degree. Yeah, Higgs um, like. So 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 um, this lambda will be the sort of you know dimensionless thing that that basically gives rise to the um, uh, to to the the. Um, uh, well, yeah, so, so the lambda will basically be the overall coupling, and the eta will be the, the um, uh, you know, the, the vacuum expectation value of the field. So the, the place where the field is at, it, is at its minimum is, is where the absolute value of the field is eta. So there are simple expressions both for um, mu um, and, um, and for the, the um, size of the string in, in terms of these quantities, lambda and eta. Okay, thanks. All right, you're welcome. Um, okay, so, so Can I also, while you're at it, I also don't remember what uh, determines the thickness of the string. What uh, is that, like what parameter should I be thinking here? Oh yeah, so, um, so, so basically what you, so, so let's, let's think about, you know, sort of both domain walls and, and, and strings. So, so basically the idea is um, that um, remember that these field configurations have both uh, gradient energy um, and, uh, and potential energy. So, so now um, imagine, so, so basically the field is constrained to be zero um, right at the center of the string. Um, so that is to say in, in this sort of Mexican hat potential um, version, the, the field at the center of the string is going to sort of sit at the top of the potential. So now you wanna ask yourself, what configuration will the field have so that the total energy is minimized? So on the one hand, it could very quickly go to the bottom of the potential, but that would cost you lots of gradient energy, or it could very slowly go to the bottom of the potential and, and that would, um, the, you know, then you wouldn't have so much gradient energy, but you'd have too much potential energy. So there's a, a sort of compromise um, where, you know, you have about equal amounts of gradient energy and potential energy. And that's that's what determines the thickness. So you can you can sort of read that off. So in this sort of you know lambda phi to the fourth theory, you 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 can read off you know just from that that notion of compromise that that gradient energy has to be about equal to total potential energy. You you, you can sort of read off what the thickness is. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of initial condition would also play a role, I guess. Well, it's not it's not really initial conditions. I mean, it's it's basically so so. You want to think of the gradient energy as basically like um, the the sort of top of the potential times the the um, uh, yeah well so so the gradient will basically be you know the the difference between top and bottom of the potential um, divided by the thickness squared um, and now when you you integrate that you'll you'll get sort of the total you know gradient energy and then the the sort of potential energy will, will, will basically be like um, the the sort of top of the potential, um, you know, and and then multiplied by the volume that you that you get within the thickness. So so basically, you 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 just get the thickness um, from you know sort of the overall um, uh, you know the, the the overall potential. Right. It's 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 basically just um, you know what do I have to do to to sort of make the the so so basically when you're when you're making the the you know when you're minimizing the energy roughly speaking you get about the same amount of energy and potential energy and and um, and and gradient energy. So you just want to ask yourself, okay, well if I have a particular thickness then what's my gradient energy and what's my total energy? Um, and, and then from that, you can figure out what, what the thickness is. Yeah, and I, I or, can't do it in my head, but I'm, do I, am I remembering it right? Yeah, like if the phase transition happens at God scale, then I'm expecting the thickness to be, uh, or you're saying no, whatever the parameter in the potential happens will tune that. I'm trying to get- Yeah, so, get so, at, so at the gut scale would basically be sort of the gut length. Um, okay. so, so I think, um, 
I, 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 I think it's, I think it's basically like, you know, sort of the Planck length times the ratio of gut energy to, to, uh, to, to, to Planck energy. So, so it, so it's, it, it's basically like, um, you know, as the energy scale gets, gets lower, the, the thickness gets bigger. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Right. So that so that's sort of another way of, of thinking about these things, right? So if the um so if if the um you know if the the um if the energy scale is the gut scale, then then that basically you know means that these things are are sort of you know ridiculously thin compared to anything that we've ever measured, but but at least you know somewhat thicker than than the Planck length anyway. Um, okay, so this this sort of distributional stuff um, basically um, gives rise to um, a a nice simple result. So if you consider a long straight string, um, then um, the um, and and you look at you know the perturbation to the metric, what you find is that you you still have Minkowski space except that it's Minkowski space minus a wedge. So in other words, you, you definitely have a gravitational field, but that gravitational field has no local curvature. And in fact, there's a nice simple relation between the size of the wedge that you've cut out and the mass per unit length of the string. And that simple relation is delta phi is equal to eight pi mu, where delta phi is the size of the wedge that's been taken out of flat space and mu is the mass per unit length. Um, now, a curved string um, is not quite that simple, but you know, locally it, it must look like that. Um, however, it turns out that that you actually um, get in some sense um, what you might think of as a as a large vial curvature, because if I have a um, a completely straight string, then the vial tensor is zero. But if I have a string with a radius of curvature uh, capital R then the vial tensor goes like mu over uh, capital R times little r, where little r is how far you are away from the string. Um, so that might sound like it's getting fairly big, but it's getting fairly big in the integrable way. And so that means that the, um, that the curvature is still perfectly good as a distribution. Um, OK, so we can do all this in linearized gravity because linearized gravity is a linear theory. And in linear theories, um, we get to uh, you know go ahead and and um, and use distributions whenever we want. However, linearized gravity is an approximation to general relativity, and so what we want to do is to ask um, also, well, how do we describe cosmic strings in general relativity, and do strings still make sense as distributions in general relativity? Okay. Hi. So, so now, so, yeah. so can I ask a question? Yeah. I just want to. I, I don't quite have the picture of this wedge yet. So first of all, the the domain walls are kind of uh, they're hypersurfaces, so they're sort of three dimensional in a four dimensional space, and these cosmic strings are two dimensional in a four dimensional space. Correct. And um, when you talk about a wedge, you basically mean that the. I, I don't. I don't actually know what you mean. But yeah. Okay. You mean, right. So let me. There's, let me, some, let me... there's some diffraction or something as a wave passes through it. Is that the idea? Or yeah, it's an well, angle. Okay. So, so let let me um, uh, let me sort of be more specific about this. Okay, so let's take um, a long straight string, um, and um, let's take a particular um, plane perpendicular to that string. So now we have a two dimensional plane, um, and um, in that two dimensional plane, um, we're just going to cut out a wedge, um, and we're going to identify the edges. So now, if I imagine um, two initially parallel rays um, that you know that that start out parallel on one side of the string, then because we've cut out this wedge and identified, um, that means that um, when they pass on opposite sides of the string, they're no longer going to be parallel and they're going to cross. So, so you you can think of this as um, we've basically replaced um, uh, the the sort of flat plane by a cone, right? So remember, a cone um, is still locally flat. There's there's no curvature in it, but nonetheless, because we've cut out this wedge, that means that light rays that start out parallel um, will cross. 
Oh, so so you cut out you cut out the wedge. Cosmic strings can give rise to lensing in this way. Right. So you you cut out the wedge and then you sort of identify somehow the two sides of the wedge where you made the cut or something. Um, that's right. Um, and again, that that is just for. Um, uh, I mean, that's that's just for. Um, uh, you know, um, illustrative purposes. I mean, if you think in terms of, you know, say metric perturbations, then what you want to think of is that um, sort of the metric um, instead of looking, so so in polar coordinates, right, the metric of flat space looks like, um, you know, dr squared plus r squared d theta squared. So now instead the metric looks like dr squared plus r squared times a constant um, times d theta squared, where that constant is less than one. Okay, so you so you don't necessarily have to think about things in this in this sort of you know cut and identify way, but but um, but it, but it's equivalent. So the Thanks. idea is you you've um, you've got a metric perturbation, and that metric perturbation. Um, changes um, the the metric from the flat metric to something which is locally flat, but but um, has these these sort of global properties that it will make an initially parallel light rays cross. I see, and the R is some kind of coordinate which is zero on the string, and right, uh, that's right. Um, okay, so now what we want to know. Is um, is is can we uh, make sense of these things which you know work so well in linearized gravity? Can we do the same thing in general relativity? And um, for this, um, there is um, uh, a, a bunch of results um, in uh, this old paper due to uh, Bob Garrosh and Jenny Trashen. And in fact, this is probably, you know, sort of the most important part of this talk. So if you remember um, nothing else um, uh, from this talk, you should remember that there's this paper by Garrosh and Trashen, and that you should go ahead and, and sort of read the paper and see what they have to say. So basically, um, what they do is they, um, uh, you know, sort of start from first principles and just ask, you know, what sort of properties does a metric have to have um, in order that its Riemann tensor can actually make sense as a distribution? Um, and the basic idea um, is that it had better not be the case that we start off with metrics that are themselves distributions, because there are a whole bunch of things that we do in computing the Riemann tensor in which um, we have to you know, multiply various things by metrics and um, we're not really allowed to multiply distributions, right? We can, you know, we can add distributions, we can multiply distributions um, by C infinity functions, um, and we can take um, as many derivatives of a distribution as we like, but we're not really allowed to multiply distributions by each other. So in particular, um, metrics have to be functions. Now, they don't have to be functions defined everywhere, but they do have to be functions defined almost everywhere so that they can be used to define distributions. So in other words, the metric, and it turns out it's inverse also, have to be locally integrable functions. That is, um, for any test functions, in this case, uh, tensor distributions of compact support, I have to be able to multiply the metric by them, and what I get has to be something um, that, you know, um, whose integral uh, makes sense. So that's what it means to be locally integrable. So now, anything that's locally integrable defines a distribution. And so um, in particular, that means the metric is also a distribution um, and therefore its derivative makes sense as a distribution. But that's not enough because we also have to have the derivative make sense as a function because again, it's the derivatives of the metric that are gonna give us the Christoffel symbols and some of the terms in the Riemann tensor involve squares of Christoffel symbols. So the basic idea is that uh, the other property that they assume is that the weak derivative of the metric exists. In other words, there's an actual almost everywhere defined function um, who that as a distribution is equal to the distribution that we get by taking the derivative of the metric. Um, and this weak derivative of the metric um, has to be locally square integrable because 
um, that's the the square of that quantity is going to um, play a role in the square of the Christoffel symbols, which are going to play a role um, in the um, in the Riemann tensor. Okay, so the result of you know positing this sort of class of metrics that has this property. Um, is that you know one can immediately make sense of their Riemann curvature as a distribution. Furthermore, um, if you have a sequence of metrics that approach a regular metric, then its sequence of curvatures approach the distributional curvature. Um, okay, but for our purposes, um, here's the main thing um, that uh, that one um, gets from this paper. Um, there's a result that says domain walls can be regular metrics, um, but cosmic strings cannot. Um, more precisely, um, what they show is that the curvature can be concentrated on surfaces of co-dimension one, um, but not on surfaces of, of higher co-dimension. Um, sorry, and sorry, fact, yeah. sorry, can we come back once more, maybe sure. to the previous slide? Um, uh, yeah. With the... Um, but so, so to compute the Christoffel symbols, I need these weak derivatives of the metric, but I also need to multiply by the inverse of the metric tensor. Yeah. And then I need to square those things. So somehow it seems like, it, it seems like I'm, I'm somehow I'm multiplying four things together in the end, and I'm not so sure that square integral is enough to multiply four things together. Uh, let's see. Right, right. I have Christoffel symbols squared, and the Christoffel symbols themselves are weak derivatives of the metric times inverses of the metric. Uh, right. So let's see. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm trying to think. Um, right, right, right. Sorry, what? Factor? Yeah. Um, sorry. The volume factor. Does the volume factor play a role? Mm -hmm. Um, well, so you don't, so, so, um, the way they do this, um, uh, the distributions are basically going to be um, maps um, uh, from uh, test tensor distributions into the real numbers. So all their test functions sort of have the volume form built in, and they're all, you know, basically smooth and of compact support. So basically the question is, um, yeah, okay, so let me, let me sort of think about this. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're right. I mean, so in particular, I mean, so, so the basic, you know, sort of thing that could go wrong um, is that something could sort of, you know, blow up in a place, but, um, but not quite so, um, you know, quickly as to destroy integrability, but that, yeah. So, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll have to, I, I, so I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to the question, but, but in any okay. case, you know, somehow, um, uh, you know, what they assume is enough that, that the stuff that goes into the Riemann tensor, um, you know, ends up uh, being either, you know, an integrable function or a, um, or, or a distribution. But the other factor depends on other things. But... Yeah. Oh, okay, thanks. Thanks. Right. But, but, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm sure also having, I'm having a side conversation here with Nicola Gili that doesn't have a microphone. So it's, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh, okay. Okay, yeah. thanks. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But anyway, they, they, what they do works, but I, I may be, you know, not stating it quite precisely enough. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so, so anyway, getting, getting back to the results of that paper, um, you know, the notion of treating domain walls um, as distributions actually, you know, um, predates this paper by quite a bit. So, so basically, there's a nice simple way of treating domain walls in which um, domain walls are, are um, things that are, uh, are, are metrics that are C0, but not C1, and piecewise C infinity. So in other words, you, you sort of glue, you know, two space times together along their boundary surface on which the metric has to match. And, um, but the ex uh, extrinsic curvatures don't. And, and there's a nice simple expression for the relation between the amount of delta function stress energy contained within the wall um, and the, the discontinuity in the, in the extrinsic curvature. So this, this is sort of the formalism of, of Israel for thin shells. 
And so what Gare Ocean Trash and tell us is, yes, that makes perfectly good sense as a distribution, um, but you can't do that sort of thing with cosmic strings. And in particular, um, one of the things that they note is that this, you can't do it with cosmic strings is not just some formal statement. You can take the space time of Minkowski space minus a wedge and you can um, fill it in um, uh, with stress energy in such a way that, that you know, different um, mu's, different mass per unit lengths can give rise to the same delta phi, the same size of the wedge. So in particular, um, you know, delta phi is equal to eight pi mu um, no longer makes sense. And the notion of reading off the stress energy from the exterior geometry, um, uh, they claim also doesn't make sense. Um, okay, so um, so that's that's sort of a no-go theorem. Um, and so one question is, well, you know, do do we have to accept that, or is there sort of any way um, around it? So let me um, let me tell you one sort of sneaky way um, that does allow us to get around it, but but not necessarily in any you know way that we should be happy with. So the the basic idea. Um, is that one can change their definition a little bit because, in fact, they've assumed slightly more than you need for the curvature to make sense as a distribution. So we still want to assume that the metric and its inverse are locally integrable and that there is a weak derivative of the metric. So both the metric um, and its first derivative make sense as actual almost everywhere to find tensor fields. Um, but you don't really need to assume that that weak derivative is square integrable. All you really need to assume is that the particular combination of squares of the Christoffel symbols that occurs in the Riemann tensor is locally integrable. So if you, um, if you change the assumptions, um, then you, you get a slightly larger class of metrics um, whose um, uh, curvature does actually make sense as a distribution. Um, and um, for our purposes, uh, the nice thing is that Minkowski spacetime minus a wedge is actually in this larger class of metrics. Um, so, so you can evade the, the, the Garrosha trash theorem, um, but this evasion is not particularly satisfying because now what you've lost by expanding this class of metrics is the result that um, a sequence of um, smooth metrics approaching the distributional one um, has a sequence of uh, stress energies or a sequence of, of curvatures that approach the distributional curvature. So that, that's no longer the case. And, and um, without that, um, you, you probably you know, don't want to consider the, the class of metrics. And, and you know that they won't converge because of the other thing in the Garrosh and Trash and paper, namely that you can fill in flat space minus a wedge with, with different stress energies. Um, and and this, this sort of, you know, attempt to evade the no-go theorem is in this, uh, this old paper of mine in classical and quantum gravity. Um, okay, so, um, so what should we be doing instead? Well, um, I should mention that even though there is this, you know, sort of perfectly good, um, you know, Israel formalism for, uh, for, for domain walls, um, and even though, you know, sort of Garrosh and Trash and, you know, um, tell us that, you know, that makes perfect sense in, in the language of distributions, um, even the domain wall case is not completely, as a distribution, is not completely satisfactory. And the reason is um, that uh, you're not able to sort of talk about conservation of stress energy, because in order to take the um, covariant derivative of the curvature, that means that you have to uh, multiply the curvature um, by the Christoffel symbol, and you're not necessarily allowed to do that. In particular, um, in the domain wall case, um, the curvature um, is a delta function and the Christoffel symbol um, is a step function. And so in order to talk about the derivative of the curvature, the covariant derivative of the curvature, you would need to um, be able to you know, multiply a delta function by a step function. 
Um, and so it's not as though, you know, in the Israel formalism and the Garrosh and Trash and stuff, um, stress energy fails to be conserved. Rather, it's that we're not even allowed to ask the question, you know, what is the divergence of the stress energy because it's a quantity that doesn't have meaning. So what that says is that even in the domain wall case, um, you might not, you know, want to use this distributional stuff, right? Because a theory where you're not even allowed to ask whether stress energy is conserved is not a, a fully satisfactory theory. Um, so what can one do instead for domain walls? So for domain walls, one can instead um, use the method of matched asymptotic expansions. So in other words, you can, you know, have one description of the space time, you know, within the wall itself with its natural curvature uh, scale, and then match that to the exterior space times on either side with their natural curvature scale. And, and all of that, you know, is perfectly satisfactory. You just, you know, never get to say distributions. So that sort of treatment of domain walls is contained in this old paper of mine with, with Ruth Gregory. Um, and um, probably for cosmic strings, um, this sort of matched asymptotic expansion stuff, um, although it's much more complicated than, you know, the nice simplicity of treating things like distributions, this is probably a better way to go um, in full general relativity. Um, okay, so uh, my conclusions um, are, are uh, very short, um, and basically it's just that it's very tempting to try to treat cosmic strings as distributions. Um, and while that works fine in linearized gravity, it just doesn't seem to work in, in general relativity. And so um, one should probably not yield to uh, that temptation. Um, okay, so that's basically it. Um, and so I think uh, even though we've had some questions already, um, we, have, uh, we have plenty of time for, for more questions. So thank you for your attention and, and uh, please start asking questions. Thanks, David. So if people have other questions. Let me start. Um, could you could you come back? Oh, is there one in the audience? No, no, you can go first, Jerome. OK. Um, just a slide before. This, this one? Yes, can you just repeat what is uh, matched asymptotic expansion? Um, I, okay, I so, so basically um, the, the idea of matched asymptotic expansions um, is that you want um, to um, have um, sort of one way of describing the problem that works in one region and another way of describing the problem that works in another region and um, and, and some overlap region in which um, both uh, both work. So let me um, let me give you a, a sort of classic example um, from the the WKB approximation in quantum mechanics. So remember um, that uh, the WKB approximation um, has so so as long as uh, so it, it, in some sense it's it's a sort of expansion of quantum mechanics in in small h bar. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what you find is that if you're looking at, um, say, um, a, a potential, um, that um, you have um, uh, a, a particular place, a, a sort of turning point where the potential energy is equal to the, the kinetic energy. And the WKB approximation is, you know, good on, you know, one side of the turning point you know, good on the other side of the turning point and, and no good, you know, right at and near the turning point. And, and so the question is, what do you, what do, you do? Um, and so in quantum mechanics, what you do is you notice um, that near the turning point, um, the potential is approximately linear and that we know what the solution is um, for a linear potential in quantum mechanics. It's just the area functions. So the idea there of matched asymptotic expansions is you have WKB on one side of the potential um, in the, the so-called allowed region, 
WKB on the other side of the potential and the so-called forbidden region and airy functions in between. And um, you know, to get consistency, um, you have an overlap region you know, on one side where things are both well described by the airy function and well described by the WKB approximation and similarly on the other side. So um, for the domain wall, um, again, you know, imagine that you have these, these sort of three regions. So you have, you know, the, the region on one side where you have, you know, Israel space time number one, the region on the other side where you have Israel space time number two, and then you have this thin region in which you, you have this, this, you know, sort of um, blob of scalar field that's making a transition from vacuum one to vacuum two. So um, within that, you know, thin region, um, you can, um, uh, you know, um, you can come up with a detailed solution of what the profile of the scalar field making up the domain wall looks like and what its stress energy looks like. And all you need is that, um, that things, you know, match smoothly onto space time one in region one and space time two in region two, and then everything's consistent. So, so you don't, you, you don't need to say distribution and you still get to use the Israel formalism. You just, you know, remember that the space times you're dealing with are not really zero thickness. They're, they're just, you know, some very small thickness, which you treat in this way. Cool. Thanks. How, how would you go about and apply this to cosmic strings then? Because the, uh, the geometry is quite different. Um, you don't have, you can't separate the space time the same way, I imagine. Uh, right. So, so the idea is um, now you're going to have something where, you know, near the center of the string, um, things locally um, will look um, like a, um, a sort of long straight cosmic string in, in flat space. Um, and, you know, so that's, you know, not something that you can actually calculate in closed form, but nonetheless, it's, it's some perfectly good function. Um, and then outside, um, you're going to have the actual space time, um, which is going to have this, this sort of interesting, um, uh, you know, sort of metric um, that, you know, is going to sort of look like it's missing a wedge and and for the curve you know string case is going to have this this sort of you know um, blowing up file tensor and what you want to do is to um you know um, say that a space time with a cosmic string in it is one in which there is a, a consistent match between this sort of you know interior um, uh, metric that you get from the the sort of scalar and gauge fields that make up the string and the exterior metric that that you get you know from whatever this this sort of vacuum space time that has a cosmic string in it is okay so so there things are going to be sort of more complicated mm -hmm. than you know they are in the domain wall case but but in principle uh, things should still work right is the matching can can one thing of the matching? Um, that's happening on a tube. Uh, sure. Yeah. Sort of. I mean, I mean, I mean. So the point is that, um, well, so so just like with the area function, um, it's not um, it's not that you match at a particular place. It's that um, you have an entire overlap region uh -huh. in which both approximations are good just like they are in WKB in the area function. So in other words, it's it's not as though you have some, you know, particular world tube where, you know, you go discontinuously from one description to the other. Rather, the idea of matched asymptotic expansions is if you are, you know, sufficiently close to the string in the exterior uh, space time and sufficiently far from the center of the string in the interior space time that both descriptions should agree. Okay. I mean, that's, that's basically the way matched asymptotic expansions work. And, and then presumably what this should do is to give you a set of consistency conditions for the exterior space time that, that tell you, you know, this is what a space time with a cosmic string in it has to look like. 
Thanks. Very maybe welcome. we can take the question by by Eric. Uh, yeah, I so thank you for the nice talk. I, I still want to try to understand this this Minkowski space minus a wedge a little bit. Sure. So um, if I were to just put coordinates on Minkowski space, so minus dt squared plus the Euclidean metric, and if I were to write out the Euclidean metric in cylindrical coordinates, so like mm -hmm. dz squared plus rho squared, d rho squared plus rho squared d theta squared, is, yeah. is, your, is, your, is your wedge then taking that rho squared and multiplying it by a constant that's less than one? Yes, that's exactly what it is. Okay, okay, great. So now I understand it mathematically. Um, why, why did this happen again? Was, is this identifying, like, I see, I see now you're identifying something along a cone. Was this, is this like the identification is happening on a string or, or what exactly is, is going on here? Um, okay. So, um, what you want to do, um, is to think of it from the point of view of, of, uh, solving, um, uh, the Einstein field equations. So the idea is, um, that, okay, so, so let's, let's sort of set Th this thing up also in cylindrical coordinates. So now you're looking for a solution of the Einstein field equations, um, which is you know sort of static and and translation invariant along the z direction, and contains this this sort of you know blob of scalar and gauge fields that that makes things up. Um, so when you do that, um, what you find is that you know as you get far away from the string. Um, that um, the, the um, metric that you get um, doesn't approach the, the sort of flat metric, but actually approaches just the metric that you mentioned with this constant less than one. So, so it's, it's, it's basically just a consequence of, of, of sort of solving Einstein's equation. I mean, I you're, not, you're not sort of cutting and identifying anything. That's, that's just a way of, of um, you know, um, sort of illustrating um, what the result is. That what you're doing is you're solving the Einstein field equations in, in you know, cylindrical coordinates, and you're noticing, hey, wait a minute, I don't actually approach r squared d phi squared. Instead, what I approach is r squared d phi squared times a constant less than one. Is there, is there like um, some limit, like if like the mass of the string went to zero, you would actually get back um, just normal R2? Uh, sure. I mean, so so the limit is is just contained in this, you know, delta phi is equal to eight pi mu formula. So uh -huh. so basically, the the idea is as mu goes to zero, delta phi goes to zero. Okay, and then that's probably the thing that causes the the um, the wedge. Uh, right. Again, the wedge the wedge is just a way of illustrating it because we're all used to you know making you know cones out of pieces of paper. But, mm -hmm. but, but if you want to know sort of where does it come from, um, then it's much better to, to talk about it in the way you did at the beginning of the question that, look, I just have this metric in cylindrical coordinates, and the thing that multiplies the R squared is a constant less than one. Okay, I see. And, I and see. that's just the consequence of the field equations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, okay. Any uh, any other questions? Oh yeah, I think uh, I think Gazal has a question. Yeah, can yeah. you remind me? There was at some point I think numerical simulation where you add like a dynamical way to form the domain walls or cosmic string. My question is: Is there any way to test the hypothesis, like to see what if they form, like if there's a field theory uh, description? then the metric or curvature, all of this, what behavior do they show? Like, do they show that? Um, yeah, so actually, um, so, um, so, so roughly speaking, so, so for domain walls, right? I mean, I mean, things are, 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 are pretty easy, right? I mean, so you, you, you basically, um, go ahead and and um, you know you have some phase transition and then you just randomly assign you know regions to be either you know the plus vacuum or the minus vacuum and anything trapped between those is a domain wall and you get a network of domain walls for um, cosmic strings um, 
you, you, you do something similar, right? I mean, basically uh, what you pick randomly is, is sort of the phase of the scalar field. And if you, you know, surround a place where the phase, you know, uh, changes by two pi as you go around a circle, then that, you know, region you've surrounded contains a cosmic string. And, and so this was actually the, the, um, uh, the result of, of uh, Tame Vachaspati's uh, uh, thesis, where, where he basically, um, you know, did um, uh, this, 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 this sort of thing. And in fact, it's kind of funny, um, at, at the Tame Fest, um, uh, Alex Vilenkin noted that, that this, you know, simulation was, was actually done with, with pieces of paper and dice rather than, you know, computers and random numbers, um, but it works, it works just fine either way. And, and so um, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward to figure out what kind of network of cosmic strings um, you get from a phase transition in the early universe. Um, the, the more tricky part um, is um, evolving the network of strings all the way from, you know, sort of the time that they form to the present day, for example. Right. I mean, that's oh, that's a lot right. harder, but there are there are several numerical simulations of that as well. But these are all like strings are treated. And what I mean is, are the is the gravity also being simulated or just the field theory um, on top of it? Yeah, I mean, do, well, do we um, have the you, so, so you, you, you do treat the gravity, um, but but usually in a phenomenological way. Because one of the ways um, that um, strings manage to not dominate the, the energy density of the universe um, is um, that string loops um, uh, radiate gravitational radiation and they get smaller and smaller and eventually disappear. Um, so you do have to, you know, take their gravitational radiation into account, otherwise um, they wouldn't disappear. But you can do this in a phenomenological way. And the phenomenological way is basically to just calculate um, the third time derivative of the quadrupole moment and use the quadrupole formula to you know, figure out how fast they lose energy and then just shrink them accordingly. No, I want the formation, like, you know, I want to know what happens to the metric or perturbation of metric as they form. Oh, like yeah, I don't think people usually put put that in to 